friends on Plain Spoke and I've gotten to visit with a lot of really interesting people. And um, today's guest is Reverend uh, Dr. John Ed Matheson, who is just a, a fantastic person. I've gotten to know him through the internet. I've watched hours of his stuff online uh, before now. If you don't know who he is, he is um, a, a megachurch pastor, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. He built up this huge Fraser Church over the course of a few decades big-time evangelist, church growth person. He's uh, retired now, but he's very active uh, with the John Ed Matheson uh, leadership organization. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about this here in a bit, but um, he's done a lot of really good work so far, and he's doing good work right now. But the reason I reached out to him was because Chris Ritter reposted this article um, that I'll have the link to. It's called uh, A Defining Day. He published it on um, the 13th of this month, and it was in response to a letter that the Alabama West Florida Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church sent him. And, and what it said was, we need to address the hurt and confusion that's being caused among the clergy and lady, laity as a result of your preaching in services to members and former members of the Auburn FUMC. As a retired United Methodist pastor, your active participation in this breakaway group is causing harm to a vital United Methodist Congregation. Bishop Graves and the Cabinet are requesting that you now cease preaching or providing other leadership to this group while continuing to remain a retired United Methodist clergyman. And so the very first paragraph of this article says that on March 4th, he went with his son, Cy, and uh, turned in he, uh, a, a statement of withdrawal from the United Methodist Church. So the reason I, I know that this kind of conversation needs to happen publicly is because there are um, hundreds, if not thousands, of United Methodist clergy or former United Methodist clergy, clergy that are considering leaving um, or disaffiliating, and it comes at a cost. And sometimes it's financial, um, like those who are losing conference health benefits that they paid into. Uh, there are others that are just uh, having a lot of pressure put on them not to have anything to do with any congregations that are disaffiliated. doesn't matter if they have friends there or history there. It's hard to think through all these things and know how to navigate these things, and I, I just thought the piece that John Ed wrote was so um, winsome and matter-of-fact. It wasn't uh, full of acrimony. There was no uh, anger or bitterness towards uh, his former conference or the bishop even, uh, and I've, I've, I've reported on this conference. I, it's, it's my mind that they have behaved in, in some ways that are not great. John Ed doesn't go there, but the place he does go that I thought would be really helpful for an audience is to talk about just his way of thinking through this and and decisions for the next stage of ministry and retirement having um, now withdrawn. So I've talked long enough about him. We're going to cover a lot more of his record and and why people should care about him. But before we do that, let's just John John Ed. I'm going to bring you on screen now and just thank you for joining me. Hey, thank you so much, Jeffrey. And I want to thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm because you're meeting a need that nobody else that I know of is meeting in the area of Methodism where people are maybe no longer or considering no lo being no longer United Methodist. And so thank you so much for doing this. It's a great time for encouragement. It's a time for education. It's a time for information. So I'm glad to participate with you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, well, you don't need any opportunities. You have a huge platform. Uh, friends, one of the things about John Ed, you may or may not know, he was one of the very first United Methodist, probably one of the first clergy at all in the U.S. Uh, to Not only did they um, broadcast their worship at Fraser, they got their own broadcast system set up, that their own channel, and uh, broadcast to 40 million households at one point in time. I'm sure that reaches is as big now. It's a huge church in Montgomery. When when you first started, it was in the middle of cornfields, I think, or some some kind of agriculture. Right. And then as Montgomery grew and spread, you were able to effectively uh, build up that church and minister to a lot of people. He's widely known and respected in his region. And so he's, um, I would call you kind of like a, an evangelist and church growth um, specialist. And uh, it's my understanding that your organization that you lead now focuses on that. You're kind of a, a a coaching uh, person for clergy. Do I have you right? Right. Hey, and thank you so much. One, one quick correction. Please. Now, I'm in Alabama. You're out in the Midwest. It wasn't a cornfield. It was a cotton field. So That's right. Uh, it, was, it was right there, but it was a place where when the bishop asked me if I would go, they had about a, less than 100 folks coming to worship, mm -hmm. and I said I would. He said, I thank you because uh, we've asked two other people to go, and they turned it down. 
I said, why didn't you tell me that? But it turned out to be, as often does in life, uh, to be the greatest thing that ever happened in my life, to be the pastor. And I was there for 36 years mm. at the same church. So it was a blessing for me. Yeah, you, you, it, it was obviously a blessed thing. And I, I would encourage everybody to go to the website, his website, johnedmatheson.org, and I'll have a link to that on the show notes. Right up front, they have a, a documentary that they've done on, on John Ed that is really quite fantastic. It's well done. It's about 30 minutes long. And it, it seems like God just really made a place for you. You already had a buddy there leading music, and y'all did ministry right. together for uh, decades, really. And right. the Lord just uh, blessed—it seems that he blessed everything that you did. I'm sure that they didn't put—I'm sure you had negative times and, and challenges right. and, and hardness like every pastor, but the documentary just shows the broad strokes of your ministry there, and everything seems to have gone quite well. Well, well, hey, thank you, Dr. Chris Montgomery, who is now the senior pastor and is doing a fantastic job. He's going to lead the church into a future that's super, super great. He did that document. I didn't even know about it, uh, and I didn't know it was on the website. I've got to check that back out. I, but at any rate, it was very, very, uh, had a professional group to do it, and, and uh, I just, uh, I was at a place where God was able to use me, my talents and gifts, meshed where the church was and God just opened doors. It was out in the middle of nowhere, but all of a sudden it began to develop out that way. And we started growing and growing and growing and growing. Uh, people ask, well, why did you stay? Well, why would I want to leave? And the, I was never had anybody pressure. I would be asked, what do you prefer to do? I said, I prefer to stay. And I never had any pressure to move. And uh, the bigger it got, the more I enjoyed it. An interesting thing, Jeffrey, I discovered the larger the church grew, the easier it was to serve. People always wondered, gosh, you go from such a small church and got up to 8,000, 9,000. That must have been terrible. It was easier mm. because you could develop staff people who could do things I couldn't do well. Mm -hmm. And the larger we grew, the more expertise we had in areas of specific ministry. And I was sort of the cheerleader and sat back and tried to stay out of the way of everything. So <laughs> it was a great experience. It was a great experience for me. And the television you mentioned, uh, we just had a group of laymen sit down. Uh, we always functioned on what we called the Joel group, mm -hmm. the prophet Joel. And we would meet about every three years and set the vision for the next three years or so and check where we were going. And it was that visionary group that always looked forward. And let me say, people said, boy, you are a visionary. Well, maybe partially, but I had I had picked lay people who had a bigger vision than I did. And one of those was just back in the early 80s, nobody in Methodism is doing anything in television. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. And the board voted 100%. They didn't know what they were voting for. We didn't either. <laughs> then all of a sudden it became a possibility. And then it developed from one thing, from not just local, but to be on a a national network, the Southern Baptist had the Acts Network, and somehow they asked us to serve on We were the only non-Baptist on that, but everywhere in the United States you had a Baptist church, you had the Acts Network. Mm. Well, what greater place to do? And then Inspiration, another group. So God just opened door after door after door, and then we were able to get our own low-power station, which is able to penetrate for miles around the Montgomery area, and it became such a focal point, like in race relations, when things happened, we, we, we had programming on there that anybody in Montgomery could turn to and have, you know, this is where we are, this is what we need to do. And uh, it became a powerful and is a powerful influence in the river region, the Montgomery area. Yeah, and the documentary I watched this morning, there were a couple uh, black clergy that were recorded saying um, after, you know, the the most recent race riots, the BLM riots, uh, there was a lot of turmoil around the country, and the temperature in Montgomery was relatively low, partly because of your public witness and, and platforming and engaging in dialogue with... Uh, right. And it was them. You know, that immediately, I, I got together three blacks and three white pastors, and we had enough contacts. Interestingly enough, between uh, the five of us, we had 181 years of ministry mm. in Montgomery. Mm. 
and they called us the 181 group. <laughs> and so with that long term, you develop relationships intentionally. Mm-hmm. And uh, Montgomery race wise, I mean, people would uh, would tell you it became a very positive thing for things that could happen in our. We had not a single incident in the area of Montgomery following those kinds of things because people work together. Mm-hmm. And that that made a huge difference. Yeah, you, the the word you used a moment ago, positive, seems to be a big part of your ministry. As I look at what you've done, you, you called yourself a cheerleader as well, and um, you know that that seems to be a big a big important thing uh, to you and to many people in in church growth and and focusing on the right stuff. And of course, I spoke with Warren Latham a, a few weeks ago, and I, I got that sense from him as well. You know, God is moving. And we're we are too. We're we're building the kingdom with him, and um, so as as I look at you and I look at, we're at the place in in history right now where we're kind of looking back and figuring out how we got to where we got, and um, you haven't just been active on the local level. You've been active in the confessing movement as well of the United Methodist Church. And for people who don't know what that was, and I might not even describe it perfectly, there was um, creeping leftism within. The United Methodist Church, even before it was the United <clears throat> Methodist Church. I mean, it goes back a hundred years, but there was um, a grassroots movement that was very uncomfortable with that, and eventually ended up in the uh, the formation of Good News, um, the Institute for Religion and Democracy, Life Watch. There were a couple other groups that that got started, and they banded together as the the Refor- Reform and Renewal Coalition that. Um, uh, was interested in pushing back against this creeping leftism and, and standing by the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. And so that's that may or may not overlap with the confessing movement. Um, and so help help me and my audience kind of understand what the confessing movement was alongside all that and what your role in all that was. Well, the confessing movement was a group of us who were concerned. Bill Henson, you knew from out there, Bishop Cannon was the one who initiated an early call to a few of us in Atlanta who said, we, we need to do something. And uh, from that, we were all like-minded that the calling of the church to make the world our parish and to win people to Jesus Christ was on the back burner. And there were other other issues. And we didn't intend to. All, all we wanted to do was to hold up the fact that Wesley said, offer them Christ. And so that's what we did. Now, how I got into it, I'll be honest with you, they met in Atlanta, and I had a uh, wedding I had to get back to, and when I left, they voted me as the president. Really? And so they called me later and told me. But I was delighted to do it because these were leaders. I mean, all that, again, uh, it was a pleasure. But also they wanted Fraser. Now, our emphasis at Fraser was the ministry of the laity. And we had volunteerism. And at that time, we had about 70% of the membership in a specific area of volunteerism. So they said, we don't have any money. Fraser's got all these volunteers. Uh, we'll put the home office in Montgomery at Fraser, and y'all do all the work. So that's how I got involved. Fraser got involved, and we started. It just grew like wildfire. And then we had to have an executive director, and uh, Pat Miller was the most perfect choice that could have ever been made, a senator from Indiana and a female, and she became the executive director. And and, the, and we were very cooperative with Good News, all the other um, groups, but the, the confessing movement played a strong, strong part in keeping the ship where it should be uh, as we moved forward. And that was good up until uh, finally disaffiliation uh, we disbanded and said, let's give our energy to some of the other groups that might still be be working. Pat Miller, I'm thinking I know that name. I'm thinking that um, she served alongside Keith Boyette on the group that came up oh, with yes, the protocol. Yes. Right. We well, sure. Yeah. And well, you know, when, when I was on the search committee to get somebody, and when I saw her name, uh, didn't think much about it. And when we interviewed her, now let me tell you, she. Is the num- she was the number one senator in Indiana. And she was about to leave the church. Her kids had already left because of the liberal slant. And she just said, my husband, we're about to go. And I said, listen, 
you help give leadership to us and to the Methodist Church for the fact that there is a future for Methodism. And she agreed to do it, and uh, she was a powerful uh, politician, but a great, godly, sincere, dedicated Christian lady. And, of course, in her position, she and Keith Boyette and others, the protocol, she was a part of it, and she became a great leader. The confessing movement sort of became her platform to give great leadership on a national level. And uh, just a godly lady. I went to speak in her church in Indiana. She said, you can drive my car. And so when I went out and looked at her car, the tag number had a one on it. That was her tag number one. She was <laughs> the senior person in the Senate of Indiana. So I just asked, I said, what if I get stopped? They said, you won't get stopped <laughs> anywhere up there. But she, but she is the most sincere, godly lady who was a great leader who led the confessing movement. Well, and she's leading in the Global Methodist Church now. She serves on the Transitional oh, Leadership yes, right. Committee that's right at the top of the whole thing. But she, she's a member of your church still there? No, she was in Indiana. She was okay. Uh, that's what I. I yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah she was uh, a, a Methodist in. in yeah, Indiana. I was wondering how it was that she was connected to your church and in Indiana, no. and so it's not. She was connected to confessing movement. Okay, I understand now. Right, right. right. Well, she just uh, we. Uh, it was better to have a. Well, you know, strategically, we, we didn't need it to be tagged as this is just a southern movement. This is a church-wide movement. Mm-hmm her leadership from Indiana and others that began to serve and bishops and others that joined us and helped. Uh, she, uh, she was the most ideal person that could have led as president of the confessing movement. Mm. Well, I regretted, you know, there were, I, before the, all the disaffiliation, I gravitated more towards the IRD and good news. And I always knew of the confessing okay. movement, but I didn't, Really, ever get plugged in, but um, you know. Okay. Well, they were they were sister organizations with a different focus, mm-hmm. and uh, what Good News was focusing in one area, IRD in one, uh, the the uh, abortion issue in one, and the confessing movement was to contend for our faith, mm-hmm. and that was our theme. And we had some great theologians, and uh, not only just our theology needed to be right, but the application of mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Well, we and not, and we all formed sort of a coalition of, uh, you know, all the groups you've mentioned. We need to work together, and that's why we were able to always keep the discipline as it was. Mm-hmm. We were able to uh, move forward in some areas uh, because of that work together as a coalition. Yeah, because y'all worked so well together and laid such a good foundation. Whenever disaffiliation came and all of these hoops and hurdles were put in our way, still it looks like about a third of the churches were able to get out despite much opposition in the United States. Now, outside of the United States, they didn't let any out. Uh, And of course, a lot of this is still playing out. We'll see how things go after the General Conference this year. And uh, But a lot of churches have already gotten out, including Fraser. Um, And what I'd like to do now is turn to the story of how, how and when Fraser got out, but also... Auburn, which um, dealt with much opposition from the conference. It was my impression that Fraser got out with some opposition, but Auburn got essentially shut down, and they needed someone to get them through that chapter, and you were that guy to get them through that chapter. Uh, Well, hey, Chris Mungard, the senior pastor, he, he, early on, now this was, now don't hold me, but I'm going to say about three years ago, before anybody was doing anything, uh, Chris, we looked at what we needed to do and said, let's move forward. At that time, the bishop, uh, who was very, very gracious in helping, you know, go the right things, do the right things, and all of that. Now, this was three or four years ago, and I remember telling him, I said, Bishop, I really, really appreciate it, because he, he was a good leader. I said, now, I, I hope you, I said, now, I'm not a prophet, Bishop, but Frazier's not going to be the only church. You're going to face it. And I think the general feeling of the leadership of the Methodist Church was this won't be much. This will be a little blip on the screen. And I used to turn with him. I said, Bishop, this you could, could see our conference implode. Well, he started using that term about two years later when all of a sudden 
churches galore tried to do it. Fraser had little, had, let me tell you, the vote at Fraser was very close. It was 99.2, I think, to 0.8 mm-hmm. <laughs> to disaffiliate. Mm-hmm. And uh, then it was with the annual conference, it was voted, uh, I guess, almost unanimously, you know, two or three years ago. Then as more and more churches, it became a different issue. And then they would not let some churches out at this past annual conference. And so they changed the rules, The what you have to do to disaffiliate now. It, they say, well, look, these are the rules. Well, it's like uh, telling me to walk up that wall and on the ceiling, you know. Uh, you, some things are not going to happen. You can't do so. And that's a sad, sad thing. Mm-hmm. And then that led to my own. Uh, I stayed in the United Methodist and for the effort of trying to be helpful to churches and at least, uh, you know, have a, have a word, a, a voice to speak. Uh, at this, now you mentioned in our annual conference, they started doing things that I think were just terrible. Like, for example, if you disaffiliated, pastors lost their hospital supplement to Medicare, retired people that were in a, associated with a disaffiliated church. Mm. Well, that's just wrong. Mm-hmm. It was legal, but it was wrong. And I'll just tell you, at the last annual conference, I stayed in in, in November, and when I, I spoke against that and was defeated 75% because all the conservatives had left. Mm-hmm. And I I mean, we had, we had people, Jeffrey, we had a couple of pastors who had cancer, other kinds of conditions, and then to take away your hospital and drug and, you know, your health insurance. That, that's just wrong. Mm-hmm. But it's boiled down to just a real fight in that kind of thing. It's just real, real ugly. Now, in our annual conference, over 50% of the churches or somewhere in that neighborhood have disaffiliated. Mm-hmm. And uh, the big issue has been in our annual conference, the pastor of the church not allowing a discernment process and stating you'll never vote. Mm-hmm. And so that's what happened with the Auburn Church. That was one of our major churches. And First Methodist Church in Montgomery. Now, those are two major, major churches. And there was not a, neither one of them were allowed. And they, as they started the process, they were going to do it. And then the local church changed the rules about who could vote on it. You know, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Consequently, and that that's not right to do that, in my opinion. But what happened is people said, well, we're not going to stay in an organization that won't even allow us the discernment process and to vote. So the Auburn group pulled out, and then First Methodist, which uh, has a dissident group, has pulled, has, has pulled out. And somewhere in the neighborhood of half the congregation. Now, both of them pulled out and are meeting in in locations, one in a school in Auburn. Well, I preached there several times, and that's what prompted the conference to say, look, you need to quit preaching there. Now, now let me say this. The worst thing they did, in my opinion, was my brother had been the pastor there for 25 years, mm. and, uh, and he was very helpful all on both sides. He had he'd been there so long. But then uh, when they disallowed him to do some things, he just withdrew, and when that happened, that was the worst thing that could happen because people that were undecided said, "Hey, we're uh, we're out." Mm. Now uh, they have a and the and the, sun, the the Sunday after my brother pulled out, withdrew. Uh, the choir director, the uh, youth minister, others said, "We're out," and so I preached that next Sunday at that church. Now to show you the impact. Now, here they are, a dissident group. They had 51 people in the choir mm. and an 18-piece orchestra in a church plant to, to be. Wow. And they filled up the gym. Yeah. And uh, so, But I've preached there several times, and that's what precipitated. Uh, well, what precipitated my brother's withdrawal, they got a complaint from the church. And, and I want to say the bishop didn't really want to have to deal with it, but he had to because there was a complaint. Mm. And I went with my brother to meet with the bishop and the 
the group there. You can have, he could have one representative, and I, you know, I won't go into a lot, but the, I, the bishop was just torn apart to have to meet, and and my brother just said, "Look, I'm going to save us all a problem. I'm going to withdraw." And so when he did, uh, and then First Methodist has had a similar situation. They have a dissident group that's meeting in a Baptist church that's just about to go under. I'm preaching there this Sunday. Uh, they'll have 400 people or more at this dissident group. Now, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, but it's, it's just been ugly and bad, and then the conference has taken away the hospital, you know, the health insurance. It's, it's really been a, a a tough thing in our annual conference. So when I got the letter from, and let me say this, the bishop didn't write the letter. The district superintendent did. And, uh, and but he, uh, and I don't know, I, I'm not going, I've got, a, I've got a theory, but I'm not going to say who I think uh, all of that came about. But so when they did that, I just decided, hey, if I don't obey, if I don't do what they've asked me to do, then they're going to have to make a decision about me. What do you do if you don't obey? Mm -hmm. And and I, I just I thought, prayed about it a lot, and uh, I didn't want to put the bishop in that kind of, to have to make a decision. And whatever decision, if whatever decision they'd make to me, against me, would be, I think, terrible for the whole conference, both those staying in and those going out. So I just said, look, my best bet is to go ahead and withdraw now. I'm going to anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I became, and I was, it was an interesting thing, Jeffrey. I was pastor emeritus at Fraser Free Methodist and still in the Methodist church mm -hmm. there for a little while. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, I'm a full Fraser uh, pastor emeritus. And I don't know what's going to happen in these other two churches, as, uh, but I feel totally free. I can preach anywhere and, and Part of the bylaws of my ministry said that it would be intentionally interdenominational, interracial, and international. And I preached in all sort every denomination you can think of. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was it was no different for, for what I've been doing, but it was different for the situation with the United Methodist Church. Now, I've taken too long, probably to. No, to say no. I, I wanted I you. I would have just peppered you with more questions till I, I got that information. I'm curious now. Is, is your ordination held in the Free Methodist Church now? It's in the Free okay. Methodist Church. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I was going to wrap up our conversation yeah. by talking about the Free Methodist, but I, I wanted to hit the meat of the conversation now because I realize there are hundreds, if not thousands, of clergy uh, retirement age that are doing this calculus right now of if they really should cut ties with the United Methodist Church, submit their uh, credentials or and their relationship. And of course, every situation is is different and there are a lot of variables, but do you have a word of comfort or encouragement or insight for people that are uh, doing this calculus right now? Well, the way I understand it, that every annual conference has different rules about how to do it. And the rules changed in our conference after about a year and a half, which made it almost impossible to meet the standard. And here's the sad part, too. I've got some close friends who were told by the authorities, don't hurry. That nothing's going to change, and even though the, you know, the time runs out last December, we'll work together to help you out. Well, that's changed entirely. We're not going to help you. You can't get out. So churches are having to decide, well, are we just going to leave and I don't know what's going to happen in many churches. Uh, I've got one fairly large church, a friend, and 80% of the membership wants out, but they wouldn't let them. They were, they were, they were waiting mm -hmm. on, the, on the word of what the authority said, you don't need to hurry. So now if they leave, 20% left in the congregation can't keep a church going. I mean, it's just it's a terrible thing. I wish there would be some kind of of just compromise and let's just look at what what can we do and uh, I don't have a good answer for that but I firmly believe that churches ought to be able to decide whether they want to stay in the United Methodist Church or if they want to disaffiliate and have a 66% vote I mean 
that that even that amount is a more than half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, and and so <clears throat> part of my situation was when they said don't preach. I asked for a clarification. You know, you said don't preach at Auburn. I said, is that the only church? They said, no, we meant to say all disaffiliated mm -hmm. churches. Yeah. So I just commented in my statement of drawer, one half of all the churches in Alabama, West Florida, in North Alabama, in South Georgia, and in Mississippi are disaffiliated. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to abide by that kind of, I, don't, I mean, that's, I'm going against what God called me to mm -hmm. do, and I wasn't going to do that. If I'd say to anybody, I don't encourage people. I, I, some situations are going to be extremely tough, but whatever God leads a pastor to do, you have to do that because it's better to be with God uh, in a minority because that'll become a majority because if you do what God wants to do, then your ministry will be fulfilled. Mm. It's a it's it's a hard well, and I, I love that final note you're on. I mean, that's where I really get going is you know, if a, if our if our faith doesn't require sacrifice, then what what how exactly how important is it if you never have to sacrifice or risk anything for it? And then to just trust that God's on the other side of that and he will that he sees and he he rewards as he sees fit, you know, and not to have this concern about what man can do to you is is really key. It's easier said than done, of course. And um, you know, when when it came time for me as a local licensed pastor to to entertain disaffiliation, knowing that I was vulnerable, I did my own calculus in my own way, and I was bolder than most, but not as bold as as some. And I I certainly don't cast aspersions who've done the math a bit differently than than me and you. But I I think it's it is important for people to at least see people who. Um, who lost relationships from it, and to hear you talk about it now, I hear the sadness in your voice because you, you knew and loved and respected a lot of these people before this present moment came, and the battle lines were drawn, and and suddenly all the the goodwill that was between you uh, evaporated. I'm using my words, uh, and, and maybe you wouldn't sure. use the same words, but I, I resonate with what you're saying. It's happened all over uh, the connection in in America, and it's really been. Uh, heartbreaking to see that a lot of the professional and personal relationships built over those years didn't count for as much than a lot of people thought it did. Um, within your conference in particular, back when I was researching it, I remember your former Bishop Graves. Um, he seemed re real solid. Everybody trusted him and, and liked him, and he said things like, everybody's going to get to where they need to go. Um, he made this all right. Several times, and then um, when when it was revealed just how many churches didn't want to be a part of it anymore, it, he seems to have, you know, it, it'd be easy. What I anticipate he would say is, "Look, this was a board of trustees decision. This is a conference decision. It's not me." Mm -hmm. But as I've understood how power works in the United Methodist Church, it, it doesn't seem to me that boards of trustees really ever hardly hardly ever do anything that a bishop has not asked them to or blessed on some level. It's very hard for me to believe that Bishop Graves has not um, been on board with this current approach, and that that's quite bothersome. You know, that, that speaks to his integrity. And it's not just him. It seems like something happens to lots of people once they become a bishop. What, the, what they've said before, their loyalties before, seem to just kind of evaporate sometimes. Now, I, I was going to try and push you a little bit on your former bishop, but I don't think that would be helpful, actually. So what I think is helpful at this point is you've said, you said in writing, you've said to me personally before recording and now on recording, Bishop Graves has been good to you. And so I yeah, just wanted yeah. you to take a couple minutes to talk about sure. the good things about Bishop Graves and how he's been good to you and, and maybe offer a, a blessing for him before we move on to the next topic. Sure, yeah. Uh, the bishop has been good. I, I go back to Fraser three years ago. Let me tell you, Jeffrey, he helped Fraser as if he had been the assistant senior pastor. I mean, he was just helpful. I mean, when a question was asked, he said, let me find that answer. I mean, he helped, but he then got, I think, caught up in just an overflow. It's almost like when it's raining, you know, there's a, some water there, but then all of a sudden a tidal wave comes. Mm -hmm. And when that hit him now, I would have to say to you, I'm afraid that uh, 
in, in my opinion, in this annual conference, there are some leaders who have done some things that the bishop, he did not instigate. But also at the same time, he has said, I can't do anything about it. Now, uh, so I'm, I'm going, and that's why I, I didn't want to put him on the spot of how to deal with me. Mm. I didn't want, and, and I'm not being uh, egotistical or anything, but if he had, what's he going to do if he asked me not to do that and I keep doing it? Mm-hmm. What's his next step? And and I'm at the end of my, you know, I'm 86 years old. I'm doing, I'm having more fun in the leadership ministry than I've ever had. Uh, we do, we're reaching 90,000 people a week through the internet and things I'm doing there. So I still like my future's in front of me, but I don't want to end it on a battle that doesn't make any diff wouldn't make any difference in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I did uh, what, what I did. I respect him. Uh, uh, but now, again, as I said, the letter did not come from him. Neither of them. And now I don't know what that means, but it didn't, he was quoted and he's got more to, you know, he's, he's looking after I think two or three annual conferences now. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't, I don't know, but he is, if I, he would be very helpful if I called him today to do anything. I, I have the greatest respect for him, even though I can't explain to you why I got the letter and said the bishop in the cabinet has said, mm-hmm. and uh, and the rules it changed. I don't think he, the trustees, did that. And I, that's helpful to I, hear. I that's interesting to hear. Uh, right. Now that's my opinion, uh, mm-hmm. because I've had some dealings. It's it's just like it's like the insurance. The issue, you know, I mean, I was I was involved in a lot of that, and I couldn't believe that people would take away. It's not a financial issue. We got more money in that fund than anything else. Everybody's paid into mm-hmm. it. Everybody's expecting it, and but then they take away. Now, it didn't affect some people. Now, I, I can get along. But look, we had so many, many, many pastors who retired and felt strongly about disaffiliation but don't have the financial resources, and they're left out. And fortunately, fortunately, some help has come to help some of them, mm-hmm. and that's good. But that shouldn't have to be. Right. That, that shouldn't have to be. Yeah, something I've said in a lot of my talking through this stuff is there's a difference between talking about what's legal and what's moral, and the Amen. the church should be able to discern the difference between these things. But part of the sadness of this present moment is a lot of United Methodist leadership has not wanted to discern these things and, and has had it in their power to turn the temperature down and has chosen not to. And so it really has been a sad thing to behold. And then the hard thing for people... Uh, in churches like yours, is you've gotten out, you're free, um, and so there's this, right. there's this real strong pull to just look forward and move forward and not look back anymore. And yeah, there's still some stuff wrong that's not right, and yeah, there's still some people left behind, but there's really nothing to be done about that. And I've been one of the voices saying, "No, we really shouldn't move along until we've made sure that that everybody out gets out." And so that's kind of been one of the reasons I started doing this. Do you feel like there's anything left to be done that that would help those who are left behind, or what? What are your thoughts around that thought process? Let, let, let me say the best thing the United Methodist Church could do at the next general conference, in my opinion, for a future for the UMC, would be to have some open door whereby churches could disaffiliate and churches would have the opportunity to decide that. Mm-hmm. The worst thing they can do if they don't do that, I, I just uh, I don't see much future for the UMC because more and more folks are going to drop out. I mean, it, it's it's exciting to go last week and preach at Auburn, and the gym is packed with folks. But uh, and and it's going to grow. I mean, let me tell you, the leadership of that whole community is in the pullout group which is now called Christ Methodist of Auburn. And their future is bright. Mm-hmm. But 
they would not have even been where they are now had the trustees allowed and the church allowed, let's discuss it and then vote. Uh, everybody ought to have a chance of making that decision. And if people don't like what the decision is, then they they can, you know, find another church or do something. Sure. But I, I, the best thing that United Methods could do would be to open it up and say, let's quit. Let's quit seeing how punitive we can be on either side and start seeing how much we can cooperate together because our enemies are not the United Methodist Church and the Free Methodist. Our enemies is Satan himself. And we need to be united in fighting him, not fighting each other with all of our time, energy, and money. Well, you have that clarity, but when they don't even believe in Satan to begin with, then they can't come alongside you. So, you know, it's it's a, it's a difficult situation, but I... Right. I do appreciate your thoughts on that, and I, I wanted to. I, I the final area I knew I needed to hear your thoughts on was um, the Free Methodist Church. Fraser went to the Free Methodist right. Church. Mm-hmm. Your Free Methodist clergy. The reason that I didn't take them seriously as an option for my church. I actually met with a superintendent of my area. It was a lovely conversation, mm-hmm. but um, I came to understand that the trust clause is still a practice of the Free Methodist Church, and I heard different things along the way that. Um, Okay, when you come on board, they're not going to make you have a trust clause for any buildings you have then. But then, if you build something new, then that will be under the trust clause for the Free Methodist Church. So it just seemed like a, a once burned, twice shy. I think is the the saying. Right. I don't know if that's a saying, <laughs> but it yeah yeah. It it just seemed like it was out of the frying pan and into the fire, maybe or, or something like that. But your church looked at things a bit differently, and you did. Great homework on that. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on why it was y'all chose the Free Methodist Church, why you're glad to be Free Methodist pastor, and um, uh, what it is that you think. My my loyalty, you know, I'm Global Methodist, and I'm I'm not necessarily recruiting for the Free Methodist Church, but there are all these churches that disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church that are currently untethered, and if for some reason the GMC isn't a good option, maybe the Free Methodist Church is a good option. I'd like to just hear you talk about that for a bit. Uh, well, let me let me say, being untethered is a dangerous place, in my opinion, mm-hmm. because accountability, uh, those kind of things. And if you look at some of the large untethered churches across our country, what's happened in the last three or four years, they've become untethered <laughs> totally because of, sexual misconduct, financial misconduct, and those kinds. So I'm very strong. It, now, the people, that I've, I've got some good friends who said, we're going to take a couple of years and study it. Now, that's okay. That's wise. But for them, <clears throat> they made it clear, being an independent, <clears throat> excuse me, is not an option. The global Methodist, I tell people, and most of our people have joined in our conference, the global Methodists. Mm-hmm. I'm a strong supporter of that. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference. The Free Methodist, uh, and I'd have to say to you that I would need anybody I'd like to put. Chris Montgomery was the one that did all the homework on that. I do know that Fraser has total control of all of its property. And the technical part of you said if you build something else, what that would be. I'm not, I don't know the answers to that. Uh, but uh, the Free Methodist, I found to be the most encouraging. Uh, there are a lot of large churches, a lot of churches that are now moving into the Free Methodist because of several things, their basic philosophy on missions, their basic philosophy on apportionments, uh, their ideas, we don't want to send money to a institution. We want the money to stay in the local church because you know how it ought to be spent. And financially, it wasn't a financial decision, don't hear me saying that, but uh, financially, Frazier will pay far less in apportionments in the Free Methodist than it did in the United Methodist Mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, they have a cap even on what, you know, the apportionments can be. But it wasn't a financial decision. Let me say also when Frazier disaffiliated, the global church was not organized. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was this was three years ago or so, and 
again, questions, one of the issues was, and the global church still hadn't finalized a lot of things, couldn't really say for sure this is the way it's going to be in governance or in finances or in other things. The free Methodist, you were clear what you were getting into. It's been here a hundred years. And so that that was primarily part of the couple of the reasons that, that Frazier went with the free Methodist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, uh, the bishop of the whole area was a United Methodist who wanted to start a church and uh, in Columbus, Georgia, and going through all the stuff, never could get it to where you could start the church. So finally, he just said, I'm going to start the church. And when he did, today that church, they probably had 1,700 folks in worship last Sunday, and it's a free Methodist. <laughs> I mean, we've lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of congregants to that would have been Methodist, United Methodist. But the bishop there was was a former United Methodist. Uh, he And he's, their, their uh, annual conference is very, 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 very sm- little bit of legislation. It's mostly worship and training. And I like that. Uh, uh, the method, you know, we go to general conference and I was a delegate several times all you do is argue for two two weeks mm. and I, I said the best way the United Methodists ought to come and vote on the homosexual issue the first day and get that behind you because I've never seen anybody change their mind <laughs> after two weeks yeah but so I want to be in a denomination that's not arguing about something but it's saying how can we win more people to Christ mm-hmm. and the global Methodist Church I think will do that my prayer is it's it's a good a good good organization i know that's the intent so well and that kind of segues into where i kind of thought it might be nice to close the conversation on is just you've served the methodist movement all your life uh, your father was a methodist preacher as well right mm-hmm. yeah and your brother and let me tell you part of that defining thing the other day was it's the first time in a hundred years that the Matheson name has not been on the clergy role of the Alabama West Florida Conference. Mm. Yeah. And that was the most emotional part for me, probably, that when I did it. But for my grandfather was a part time Methodist preacher, my father, my brother, and myself. Mm. And now there is the Methodist name is no longer. Well, you're still a Methodist, but you're right that that institution that the United Methodist yes, no, I hear you, and and the thing you say in the article, which a lot of people in my congregation also said when disaffiliation came, was I really don't feel like I'm leaving the United Methodist Church. I feel like it left me, you know, and it, it really did. I mean, it always had far left liberal tendencies, but only in recent years did it just go whole hog in that direction, such that there was. Mm-hmm just no realistic way to turn it around. So that even when the general conference said, we're going this way, they just said, no, we're not. And, and at that point it became unworkable. So that chapter is closing for me and you, it's closed. Mm -hmm. You've, you've served this movement for decades of your life, uh, in the helm of a, a local church, but also done larger organizational work. You have colleagues around the country and the world what is it that you're hoping that Methodism, whether we're talking about free Methodist, global Methodist, what it is that what is it that you hope the word Methodist means in 50 years that that we're reclaiming right now? Well, I guess my greatest would be Wesley's charge to the people that came to America: offer them Christ, and whatever it takes, that's the way we would do it: offer them Christ, and uh, whatever. The denomination, if it's Southern Baptist, if it's Nazarene, whatever. I preached in, I mean, one of the most evangelical churches two weeks ago that is a uh, Christ Anglican. I'd never had this many robes on as I had to put on for that service. But, you know, theirs is a, but boy, they are a force for evangelism. So the denomination doesn't make any difference. It's what that local 
group of folks have as their primary, not saying it, it's not something we put in a statement, uh, you know, making disciples for Jesus Christ. You know, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Mm-hmm. And uh, that every local church will find a denominational place where they can best express their gifts. And and what I think the mission of the church is, is to go into the world and preach the gospel to every person. And uh, the, what it takes for local churches to do that is what we need to do. So that's obviously what you're still invested in. Uh, you're, so it's the John Ed Matheson uh, Leadership Institute. Is that what it's called? The, leadership Ministries. There yeah. it is, Leadership right. Ministries. And the, the website is johnedmatheson.org. And, uh, you, well, now see, when you get to be 86, you need a website and an email that helps you remember your name <laughs> and remember that. So, uh, so that's why... My name is in both in both of those. It helps it helps me to remember better. Uh-huh. So, uh huh. So, well, my my last thing was just wanting to promote what where you are and what you're doing right now. And so, what kind of people should be looking at your organization, um, your your leadership organization? Well, let me just say, every day, every morning, I do a 58 second thought for the day, and I do it on secular radio stations. There are several of them that carry it. So I'm trying to reach folks that are not, uh, they're not on the religious stations, they're on the secular stations. Mm -hmm. We also put it on Instagram and Facebook and all of that, and it's very simple to sign, it's 58 seconds, because that's the time they allot for commercials and everything. So if if somebody wants that, then I do a blog every week, which is, uh, you can also sign up and receive it. It just comes on your phone. All you got to do is mash a button and you can read it. Several newspapers carry that. A lot of people, uh, it's distributed. Uh, people share it. Uh, I've got one friend who's a lawyer, who not a member of my church, but he said, would it be all right if I shared your blog with my mailing list? Well, I didn't realize his mailing list was in the thousands. So, I mean, it, it goes out uh, into that. And then I do a, every morning, every morning at 10 o'clock, I do a good news. I think we need good news, and it's just a verse of Scripture, and uh, it's uh, on Facebook, Instagram, that kind of thing. And then once a week, every Monday morning, I do a got a minute. That's how all of this got started, a got a minute video, which is not, doesn't have to fit a time frame, so it's a little over a minute sometimes, never over two minutes. But uh, as my friend said, you need to call it got a minute and a half. We call it <laughs> got a minute. And, and and I'd have to say, Jeff, this was done for Methodist in Alabama, not Oklahoma, mm-hmm. because the attention span of Methodist in Alabama is about one minute. <laughs> and if I, can, uh, if I could tag into that. And the good thing about that is that people don't like it. It's easy to delete, and that's it. So if People would like to just tag in. It, it, so many, many folks have, are finding it helpful. And it's the way that I'm finding it this time to uh, do a ministry that's meeting the needs, I think, of people uh, by offering them hope, truth, and so mm-hmm. forth. Uh, it's not, I, I used to quote last Sunday at church uh, the church cannot be the salt of the earth if it sugarcoats the gospel. Mm-hmm. And so many people sugarcoat what's happening in the world today, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. churches, and uh, you, you will never be the salt of the earth doing that. Right. But speaking truth, and uh, to the best of my ability, I'm not trying to say I've got a corner on truth, but from my perspective, this is where I think we need to go and, and what is truth. Yeah, you neither you nor I have a corner on the truth, but we we follow right. the one who does, and so that's, that's right. uh, far be it from us if we water down or sugarcoat yeah. what we've been entrusted. Right. So, well, Amen. we we could spend I know a lot more time uh, enjoying each other, but I try and keep these things to an hour, and who knows, maybe we'll have occasion for another one of these. But John Ed, it's really been a, an honor and a blessing to me, and I know to a, a lot of other people who watch this, and so just on behalf of. All the Methodists in particular, just thank you for your leadership and your service. Well, good, and, and thank you for doing mm-hmm. this. And I, I would encourage, let me tell you, 
I, we got into television because nobody was doing it in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, now what you're doing and, uh, you know, the digital world is open unbelievably. And we all need to learn how to use it more effectively. And uh, I've, I've got a board and they sort of encourage me and show me stuff. And that I was embarrassed when you asked me about a computer. Now, I don't know the technical side. I do all the writing and mm -hmm. recording. Somebody else has got to get it out there. And we, my ministry pays a pretty good sum to a company who knows where to put it, when to put it, how to put it, and all of that. It's the same message, but uh, what in every church you got folks that are capable of doing that well. And I would encourage, I want to thank you for doing this. And you keep up what you're doing because you're on target to helping meet a need. And uh, that's one of the marks of what a ministry is. Is it, is it really meeting a need? If it doesn't meet a need, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it so, is my intention to be helpful, and I, I feel good about a lot of the work that I've done, and I'm optimistic about the future. And so to that end, I just turn to the audience now, and if, if you do think what I'm doing is, is good, then you can always go to plainspoken.locals.com. That's where you can go and support me. Uh, but then I'd also encourage you to go to John Ed's uh, website, uh, which is in the show notes. We've talked about it several times before. And if you want to sign up for any of the segments that he's talked about, follow him on Instagram. I'm not even on Instagram, so he's doing better than me. Uh, but yeah, consider the ways that you can tap into the good things that are going on right now. John had said, you know, there's a lot of people trying to sugarcoat things, and we can't sugarcoat things about the world. We need to hold on to leaders that are going to tell us the truth and equip us and, and help us move bravely and boldly into the future. So John Ed, thanks for being a part of God's ministry in that way, and I'll keep carrying that banner forward with you, brother. Great. Hey, I'm glad I'm on your team, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thank you.